Let's take a look at the next step. Again, I don't have that particular zone uh, simulation. The preceding chemical reaction, C sub R, E sub R. Now, when the preceding chemical reaction is large, We would expect to have a, basically an equilibrium situation set up, and it's reversible so that it is an, it's an, it's an equilibrium case. So we have two equilibrium cases. Now with, with large K, what is going to happen? Well, essentially nothing's going to happen because as soon as we make A, as long as equilibrium is pretty rapid, it doesn't really matter. It's made as soon as we need it right at the electrode surface. So uh, a large K, the reaction is just as normal. It just looks like a normal CV wave, no different whatsoever. Now if we have a small KF and KB, so we can break that down into components, we can still may have an equilibrium situation, but we can have a slow attainment of equilibrium. In that particular case, if KF and KB are slow, then we have a problem because we have no initial concentration of species to reduce. And that means the voltammetry will be quite affected in that particular case. Let's take a look at the zone diagrams and we can see what we mean by that. We have C to A in this case, KF of KB, and A to, to B. Zone diagrams, we have D sub O, which is uh, essentially diffusion only, I think. These are written by uh, French guys, so sometimes they're, uh, they got weird uh, units. <laughs> so that's why we have some. Pure kinetic, okay, K sub P. Uh, D sub B, e, I'm not sure. Let's see what they mean by that. Oh, well, let's take a look at the. So here we have a uh, log K, and the K is our equilibrium constant for our preceding chemical reaction. Lambda is our kinetic term, KF over K, KF plus KB. So K is an equilibrium term, lambda is our uh, kinetic term. And we can still have a large kinetic result and still have a, a small are a large equilibrium and still have small kinetic effects. And you can see a, on a little diagram we have a couple of different things. As we're going up the scale, we're seeing a large and larger equilibrium constants. As we're going to the, to the left or to the right on the scale, we have larger and larger kinetic values. And going to the left, we're having slower and slower rate constants. In this on this one side of the scale, as I said before, when lambda is quite small, um, that means that our rate constants are, are basically not applicable. Whatever we have initially in the system by the equilibrium conditions will stay at, at those points. So whatever the normal equilibrium concentration of A is, is not really going to be perturbed in that process. By using up some A, the equilibrium is so sluggish we will not long we not will not make any more A by the equilibrium process. So we would get a CV wave that would be reflective of whatever the initial concentration of A is by the equilibrium conditions. That's different than point D E, where now the equilibrium is uh, more rapid. In the, in the rapid part of the situation, and also the rate constants are also very rapid. In that case, that means that the equilibrium is much more rapidly achieved, and so effectively it means that C is produced, produces A at whatever rate we require. So again, we would have uh, CV, but now the wave height, for example, would be reflective of the concentration of species C as the formal concentration of species C, whatever amount of C that we've initially put in. Whereas in DO, we would reflect the peak current that would be reflective of the equilibrium concentration of species A. 
A case of G is a general case where everything gets mixed together, hard to, harder to understand. A case of O is uh, another intermediate case. A case of P now is a situation where the equilibrium constant is sluggish, but is, or the equilibrium constant is low. In other words, there's not a large amount of A ever present in the system uh, because the equilibrium does not pr go to that, the, the, that way very much. But uh, the, re the reaction is um, still fairly rapid. In that case, the reaction is like the um, preceding chemical reaction. It's, it's like the catalytic reaction. There's a kinetic current there. So you can see in the DE case, the EP change depends on the equilibrium constant. The P current will shift as a function of the equilibrium constant. The larger the equilibrium constant is, the more it will shift. But as we get to really large values, then the, the, the term basically goes to essentially to one. So the sub O case, the E peak does not shift as we expect. There's no change in the, uh, uh, the, the kinetic effects are basically zero. In the KP case, the limiting current is dependent on the equilibrium constant times the forward and the reverse uh, equ uh, rate constants. Now why is that? Why, why, is, why are we getting this kinetic effect? Because here we're feeding in the uh, values of A at a, at a limiting K, in a limiting way. There is enough a reaction going on to get that material coming in and it'll, that will limit the overall rate of the reaction. The rate of using up the material is, is balanced by the rate of uh, production of it. It's simil similar in a lot of ways to the rotating disk collector. Remember in the rotating disk collector we said that we'll have a diffusion layer and outside the diffusion layer the solution stays stirred up by the rotation of the disk. <coughs> so in this diffusion layer we'll get a, a, a linear change in concentration outside that diffusion layer will get essentially the bulk concentration. Similar situation happens when we're having a reaction occurring. The reaction, instead of a diffusion layer, will have what they call a reaction zone. In that zone, the concentration changes basically linearly but as set by the, uh, by the equilibrium conditions. Outside that zone of the reaction, the uh, reaction, the concentration is essentially the same as the bulk. Okay. So CE is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting case because you get normal looking CVs in one case that are not normal looking, they're not really normal because they depend on the equilibrium constant. Uh, then you get normal looking CVs that are much smaller than you'd expect because they're based on the equilibrium concentrations, not on bulk concentrations of something. And then you'll get uh, sigmoidal type waves that uh, depend on, again, on the equilibrium and the rate constants themselves. Okay. Here we can. Uh, take a look at our reactions so far and we'll summarize them. Here's our mechanism. It's going to change, it's going to be the change, the change of the cathodic peak position as a function of scan rate. In other words, how much the peak position will shift per decade change in the scan rate. Is the delta E peak, in other words, how much is the um, peak separation of the two peaks? The cathodic peak as a function are divided through by the scan rate and the anodic current over the cathodic current and any other conditions to identify it. So you can use this as kind of a, a diagram to try to determine what kind of um, kinetic condition you've got. E sub r is going to be independent of the scan rate. Again, the irreversible 
a reversible process. 59 millivolts over N is the case. Peak current is independent of scan rate. The ratio of is one independent of a scan rate. The irreversible case, remember we see a negative shift, a, more, a shift to more negative potentials d divided by A. And uh, peak current would be proportional to, it'd be at least 200 or more millivolts. Uh, Quasi-reversible, something in between the two. C sub R, preceding chemical reaction followed by a reversible chemical reaction. The peak, cathodic peak, we're gonna shift positive with a change in the scan rate instead of a negative shift. You'll see that the peak current will decrease with increasing uh, scan rate. In other words, we'll get a less um, peak current as the uh, we'll get less peak current as the scan rate increases. The ratio of IPA over IPC is now greater than one, and it will increase as the scan rate increases. Irreversible, C reversible. We have an EC reaction. It's going to shift. Uh, it's going to shift uh, about 60 over N millivolts. Essentially, well, if we have a large K over V value and a small equilibrium. In other words, the uh, equilibrium constant is fairly small, and that will we'll get that sort of case. Peak current is approximately independent of scan rate, not always, and so on. When we have an irreversible following chemical reaction, we're going to see a smaller amount of shift. The peak currents are independent of the scan rate. And the E-peak and the cathodic peak currents are independent of the concentration of the initial species. For example, another type of possibility is a second order reaction, especially probable is some sort of dimerization reaction for some species. So now the follow-up chemical reaction is not, for example, a cleavage, but it might be a dimerization. The shift would be different, a little bit less, but the, what's important there is you'll see a change in the peak position and the ratios with the concentration of species O. Because before, the first order doesn't matter on the concentration, the second order does depend on the concentration, and so that's how you can detect those effects. If you have a reversible and a catalytic following into irreversible chemical reaction, which is a catalytic reaction, you'll see a shift uh, positive. The peak current will decrease with, decre or the increase with decreasing scan rate. Again, we're shifting now into that sigmoidal wave. Um, when we have a large ratio of scan, uh, rate constant over scan rate, we get a sigmoid and, uh, and so on. If we have a, what they call a disproportionation reaction, similar sort of thing, except now we've got a, um, uh, a second order reaction, somewhat similar, but the peak current now will increase as we increase the scan rate and so on. And also the peak current and the peak position will vary with the concentration of species O. Right. Well, I haven't uh, done a very good job of completely summarizing that, but you can use this as kind of a guide to, to, to determining what the important things are. All right, well, let's take a look at the, uh, the next thing in here. This is a set of reactions in which are kind of a interesting cases where instead of uh, the reactions being coupled by a chemical reaction, they're just occurring naturally. And this sort of thing may be seen when you have a, a very fast intermediate chemical reaction or just maybe the fact that you might have two processes that it can occur uh, at the same electrode. So for example, A plus E to B, and then B can have another reaction to go to C. And if both of those are re reversible, we can assign E zeros to the two of them. And um, 
What we'll see will depend a lot on the positions of those two E zeros. Now the delta E zero can either be great, less than zero, in other words, the E zero two is more negative than E zero one, or it can be greater than zero where the E zero two is, is less negative than E zero one. In this case, it's a simpler situation because this would suggest that the two reactions occur sequentially. As soon as we make B, we have to increase the amount of potential that we need to reduce B to C. So we might see two separate waves under those conditions. In this case, when E2 is less than, is more positive reduction potential than E01, now we have a different situation. As soon as we make B, it's able to be reduced at the electrode surface to C. So the waves will now be significantly different than they were in this case. Now, this little diagram suggests what happens when we put electrons in sequentially. And it's not a very accurate diagram, but it suggests to you, hopefully, uh, a molecular orbital diagram where we have electrons being added into a system. At some point, we're going to have the high or the lowest the highest occupied molecular orbital, and we can put electrons in, and then we'll go into what was formerly the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or the LUMO. So we'll put in an unpaired electron, we'll put in another electron that's gonna pair up in those conditions. Now usually it's much harder to put the second electron in, especially in the gas phase, because first of all, we've added in a negative, some amount of negative charge to the system, and so that usually repels and adds an energy barrier to the second electron transfer process. In solution, however, because the uh, solvation process reduces the charging around it, of the, the charge density around any particular molecule, that second electron difference is much reduced. And also, as I said, we can have an intervening chemical reaction that will cause that to simulate a, uh, two reactions that occur simultaneously. Here we have an ER-ER reaction. When the delta E zero is much less than about 180 millivolts, now you see we have two separate one electron processes. And what you see here are what they call inapparent. And that would be the peak current that you observe at any particular point. So the peak current divided by the, the scan rate. And the x-axis is the delta E zero as we defined it previously. And that's, that would be the simplest case. Here we have two sequential reactions occurring. And many, many cases are like this. However, when we have a positive delta E zero, what do we see? Well, we see now the second electron is gonna come in at the same potential as the first electron does because as soon as we put in that first electron, the second electron is now poised to, take, to be taken up. Now we have a peak, uh, a wave that looks like a two electron wave, and it is a two electron wave. Yeah, this would be something like if you reduce a uh, quinone to the hydroquinone, you get a two electron, two proton process, and you get a nice two electron looking wave. The amount of current that you see is greater than one and it looks like you've got two electrons in the, in the system. So the number of apparent electrons in there looks like two. Notice the peak current function. Remember we said that for a single one electron wave, that peak current function is about 0.477. If we go to two electrons, what we expect, that'd be two to the, uh, to the three halves. So we'd expect a, va a factor of 2.83 on the uh, improve, increase. And we see, uh, that's what we see there. When we get to situations where we have a value of delta E in the intermediate region, now we see the waves look pretty funny. 
they don't look exactly like you'd expect. Uh, and that's, that's a characteristic of mixing those two waves together somehow and getting the results. Let's look at the delta E peak. When the delta E0 is about 50 millivolts, our delta E peak is what you'd expect for a single two electron wave. So this is delta E peak and this is delta E0. So when delta E0 is about plus 50, we've got an overlapping of the two waves by about 50 millivolts. The wave looks like a two electron wave. It's got the two electron peak separation and the two electron peak current. As we go to more negative, the peak separation increases and uh, until we get to a point where they're completely separate and then they don't, there's no real reason to talk about a delta E peak anymore because it will be the delta E peak of two separate reactions. Okay, let's look at the uh, summary here. So for delta E zero less than minus 180 millivolts, in other words, we're out here in this particular case, we're gonna have two waves with delta E peaks of 59 millivolts each. When it's minus 90, we're gonna have a split wave, something like this. You'll start to see the two separate waves there. Uh, you'll see that it doesn't look normal, but it's hard to tell that there is two waves exactly. Uh, but the, the peak separation will be much, much greater than 59 millivolts. At exactly of minus 35.6 delta E zero, we get one wave. It looks like a two electron wave, but it only has a 59 millivolt peak separation. So it has the peak current of a two electron wave essentially, but it has the separation of a one electron wave. When they're exactly zero, we expect a 42 millivolt delta E peak. As, and as it goes to greater than 180, again, it looks like a two electron wave, but now we've got the normal two electron delta E peak that we're going on. So in all the cases where we talked about the peak current and cyclic voltammetry and the peak separations, we're always discussing the situations where the second electron goes in much more positive than the first electron. So we weren't talking about just a little bit. We're always talking about much more positive electron transfers. Okay. The, uh, I, I'm putting in here a couple notes to myself. One is that these uh, reactions are considered to be non-interacting. In other words, when we put in an electron into one side of the system, it doesn't affect uh, the electron going into another part of the part of the wave. It affects it in, in one way and affects it in a in a um, well. I guess the way to say that is if suppose we put in a, we had a two waves that we could put in, uh, people, a lot of people have done these sort of experiments where we, ferrocene, common compound. Suppose we put in an electron into this particular one of the ferrocenes. We've got a couple possibilities. One is that that one electron will have no effect on this particular other ferrocene, other than the fact that there is a slight change in the electrostatic properties nearby. The other possibility is that this chain is conjugated and so the electron actually can communicate with the other uh, center through electron transfer process. In that case, we'd have a much different looking wave. And you'd see what would happen is that those waves would be separated by a distance that would depend on the degree of communication. If those two centers are identical, you'd expect the E zeros for each to be exactly the same. And so for non-interacting centers, uh, 
the peak would be n what you'd expect normally, but it would be two times the height. But it wouldn't be the two, the thing is it's not n to the three halves, it's just two n, all right? Because each comes in at that point and so on. It's not like the one electron comes in and then another electron comes in to the same point. One electron comes in here, one electron comes in here, so it's just the sum of the two. Uh, normally, remember somebody said, well, he said he had a two electron CV wave, the IP is proportional to the end of the three halves. Well, in that case, the IP would be 2.83, what a one electron wave would. But in this case, with non interacting centers, we'd have just N equal 2, or 2N times the peak current, because each comes in at a separate point. However, if they're interacting, what's going to happen? Well, as soon as we put in one electron here, it will be able to conjugate through that, uh, through that link and interact with the electron center, transfer center here. What happens then? Well now, as soon as we put one electron here, that's going to make that second electron transfer much more difficult. And so when they interact, you'll see a separation in the peaks. And so you'll see a, a separation that would depends on how strongly the interaction be, is. And it turns out people have done that. They've changed the amount of conjugation and the degree of interaction by changing that linkage. As the link is short and the degree of conjugation is high, you get a large separation. When the links become very widely separated, the separation decreases close to zero, or in fact to zero, uh, indicating that there's no interaction under those conditions. Okay. So what this is, this is about is a, a non-interacting center type situation. Okay, the, the process of putting one electron in doesn't have any effect other than the fact that it makes that whole molecule more or less negatively charged, and that has some effect. Okay. Let's take a look at some examples here of uh, this particular case where we put in uh, a different, uh, different situations. Here's the uh, zero linkage. So we have two anthracenes hooked together and those two anthracenes can be hooked by a, a linkage of zero or more methylene groups. When there's zero methylene groups there, notice this two, this, there's two separate P waves because as soon as one electron gets into the anthracene, it will interact with the second electron transfer process and there's where we see that communication. It's for you non-chemists out there, you can remember that anthracene is a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon like so, and so we're talking about this sort of situation. I'm not very good at drawing these. So there's no conjugation between the two rings? When a zero, the two rings are conjugated because we've got a direct connection from here to here. But it's just a methyl type group, it's not a double bond. Yeah, it's just a methyl group. So. When there, well, yeah, when there's zero, there should be very little, but when there's n is equal to two, in other words, there's two methylene groups in there, there's still some interaction because the, bond, the linkage is so short that there is still of some space uh, up charge sort of thing where some of the, some of the uh, electrons can be interact just through free space. So you don't have to have a conjugation to get that effect. Here you see n equal two, the peaks are, are uh, separated slightly, but not so far that, they're, uh, that, that you would consider to be at the same potential. When we go to four and six, still in, when n is equal to four, we have four methylene groups there. The current now is in peak separation, is now much closer to a two electron wave. And you can see that though then we go to n equals six, there is some slight change. Notice where the peak is here 
and the peak is here. It has shifted slightly, and so the peak separation has decreased still more from four to six. So we're still we have some effect, slight effect here. Here we're pretty much, we've lost almost entirely the effect. Let's look at the peak current. Notice in the zero case, this is the one electron wave, and you see that we have about a 5.5 microamps for the current. In the two electron wave, now we've gone up to about 8 point, uh, perhaps two there for the, uh, for the number of electrons. So we've gone to a two electron process, but again, because those centers are not interacting, it's just n, 2n, not n to the three halves like we'd expect. And it's not exactly 2n there because the, that peak current is slightly more than it should be because of the second wave is increasing a little bit there. Also, the diffusion coefficients are different too, all right? This is a smaller molecule than this one, so this has a lower diffusion coefficient and that changes the amount of current. All right. Let's take another example here. Um, we've got this uh, diamino uh, group here, and um, you can see that uh, if you do your experiment and with this particular uh, situation, those two R groups are, um, what am I trying to say here? So what you have is essentially two non-interacting centers in this particular case because uh, the uh, double bond is not making this situation plainer, so you decrease the amount of conjugation between those two centers, and you don't get a conjugation between those two. Now, in this particular case, we've, we've uh, dropped, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I was trying to think over the, I can't remember exactly uh, what I was, I was going to say here. Nah, let's skip it then. <laughs> I can't remember that. All right. Let's take another look at we're, uh, take another look at another reaction. Here we have a, a center reaction that is irreversible. Where we have. A flipped to go into B, and then the center reaction is B to C. And this is uh, like the uh, case that we've been able to show on the, on the computer screen. Again, we have two, two situations where E2 is less than E1, or E2 is greater than E1. In this case, the situation would be having two, basically two waves on the forward scan, and this would be having one wave on the forward scan. One at a time. Let's take a, I think we probably have time to do a quick, a quick uh, simulation. What we can do in this case is we can simulate our ECE reaction here, and that would be condition three, ECEC -E simulation, and we can prevent the third, this, the second C by making that C cost, uh, ma making that rate constant very slow. Uh, first of all, let's set our E0 so that the E0 of, of A is minus 0.5 and the C to D reaction is um, minus 0.75. So we have now two separated reaction, that would be case one that we've talked about here. And let's make our, um, let's make our uh, 
Great constant for the both of them to be irreversible again, 1E5, 1E5. And we'll make the decay rate for the first one to be very fast. And the second one to be zero because we were only on an ECE reaction. Okay. Well, this one here we'll, we'll ignore. Let's, let's just remove it. Okay, here we get, here what we have here is the first one is 100 reciprocal seconds, the second one is reversible. So the first wave looks like a normal EC reaction, the second wave looks like a reversible electron transfer process. So the, if we go back and look at our notes, this is the case one where we have two waves on the forward scan. I guess we'll stop here and uh, we'll uh, go on to case two in just a second.